You're listening to The Dental Guys. It's Prime Day. How to create the best conversion prosthesis. Well, John, you're in the studio here, and we're excited about talking about conversion of your implant prosthetics, day of surgery, teeth in a day. Here we go. It's John and Wes in studio today, this week, on The Dental Guys. When the dental guys need an infection prevention product, we turn to Kerr and their Total Care line. Kerr has been an industry leader in infection control and prevention products for years. And when we think of infection control, cavicide and cavi wipes are the first things that come out of our minds. It's automatic and there's a reason for that. Kerr knows dentistry and their products work. The dental guys trust Kerr products in our offices and you should too. Stay safe with Kerr Total Care. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes The Dental Guy. And I'm John The Dental Guy. And uh, we don't get to do this very often. Live. In studio. From the West Mullen studio. I mean, in beautiful Tennessee. We are, I mean, in the same place at the same time. I mean, we, we, you know, we get to hang out sometimes. We're... You know, we're not in the same town, so it's not super easy to do that, but today it worked out. So it, did. it worked out great. Man, we've had a good day today. It's been a great day. It's been, I mean, the summer, things slow down a little bit. Weather's good. Potentially, right? Or speed up in your case, actually, which we're yeah. going to get to in a minute. Yeah. But yeah, the weather's amazing. Um, vacations are kind of almost here, you know, and, and uh, it's it's been a, it's, it's been a crazy summer in my life but it's been in some ways a little, like you're about to go into crazy mode so tell everybody a little bit about what's going on in your practice life and what's going on with that's going to make life a little different for you john on top of being extremely busy i think everybody that's listening to this that isn't maybe in dental school if you're in dental school you're obviously busy all the time uh, whether you're studying for the next exam or trying to get uh, credits in and get as many um, opportunities for clinical experience as possible. Us dentists, it seems like across the country, uh, production's up. Yep. Uh, people are spending money um, in the dental office and uh, case acceptance is up. And especially in my practice, John, and in your practice, uh, case acceptance has been excellent. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing uh, patients. Um, choose excellent dentistry and yeah. i'm excited about that that's a good thing oh yeah um and um you know there's some things that um i had put in the works probably two to three years ago uh to get to the point that we're at right now john mm -hmm. and like john said we are getting ready to get extremely busy uh, we are breaking ground. In fact, I saw that they had marked utilities uh, just the other day, and they're putting the silt fence in. And our team is excited about expanding our dental practice. So you're building a building. We're building a building. I'm Whoa. building a building that I own. Crazy. I own the property. I own the building. And we are building an amazing dental facility. It's going to be a non-operatory practice. Um, and we're, I'm going to share a little bit of my journey along the way. Uh, just this week, we finalized um, some of our equipment offerings, mm, right? And, which is a big decision. Yeah, it's a big decision to decide um, what to do. You know, 17 years ago, um, I opened my dental practice and uh, built um, – a fantastic facility in a in a building that I don't own, but I did the build out, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we're moving beyond that facility. Dentistry's changed a little bit for me since then. Uh, we now have an associate. We have, you know, several. You know, we've got a lot of you know providers in our office, and, right? And we're doing you know a lot of dentistry, and our current space just doesn't hold that. And yeah. so to grow our business further. 
Um, and you're adding how many operatories then? So we're adding four operatories right Man. now. We're in a five operatory practice and with, um, a two dentist and, uh, three hygienists. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be moving into a practice that'll have nine operatories. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. That's a, uh, I did the same type of thing mm. now, you know, 12 years ago, mm-hmm. you know, when we started our build and finished and, um, same number of operatory. I think we went from six to nine, Mm -hmm. you know, we had two dentists working out of six, two dentists working out of five. That's Mm -hmm. tight, obviously, Mm -hmm. as you're feeling it. So you got, what, another six to eight months maybe of work to... Okay, so it's just getting going. So the equipment decision, um, I mean, we obviously got a lot more to talk about on the show. We get to the main topic, but, you know, this is such a huge part of... I mean, you're spending a lot of money, obviously, Mm -hmm. on the build-out, and the equipment is a big chunk of that. So. How, what did you end up going with? So and- fortunately, you know, I'm able to take some of my equipment with me. Mm. Um, so for instance, I have <laughs> ADEC chairs. Back in the day, you know, 17 years ago, I invested in ADEC chairs, and those have been rock solid. Mm-hmm. Um, they're the ones with the up, um, you know, priced leather option or mm-hmm. pseudo leather is what they call the 511 chair today there's a few little tweaks and things that they've made over the years but essentially the 511 looks like the chairs that i have in my office currently so we're going to add more a deck chairs uh, to keep everything kind of nice and symmetrical plus we know that chair is going to probably outlast me mm-hmm. as far as you know right. me practicing um, and then the question is right how what is the units look like the actual mm, day in the day delivery in, unit the yeah. delivery unit and so we definitely are a rear delivery uh, practice now that we're not going to get into that right now but that's what we are is we're rear delivery we don't have anything over the patient and so i'm going to bring up this on the screen if you're uh, listening to this and you want to go to the youtube channel you can check that out but um You know, John, you see right here on the screen, I'm going to blow it up actually a little bit bigger, but um, this is a DCI operatory. Mm. Now, um, we are purchasing in this image right here, the DCI 12 o'clock delivery system. Mm -hmm. there. Now, Mm -hmm. not the actual cabinetry there. We're actually just purchasing the thing that mounts to the wall. Gotcha. That has all the cords and suctions. It has all the cords and and suctions on there. It's like basically, you know, a swing arm that's Mm -hmm. mounted to the back of a cabinet, back of a wall. And then that could swing left or right for a left or right-handed dentist. Uh, We only have right-handed operators in our office anyway, but that's the unit. Now, for those who are listening to this, you don't have to give exact prices, but give me an idea of what this unit, this delivery unit, just this one piece of equipment, because DCI, I mean, we're not like sponsored by them or anything. But they're just, they're a great company. Um, they're known for making high quality at a little bit lower price than some of their competitors. Mm-hmm. They don't have some of the frills necessarily, but they're basic and good, very good. Mm-hmm. And uh, whether you know it or not, a lot of your manufacturers use DCI parts in their actual guts of their thing, right. even though they may rebrand it mm-hmm. to their own, a lot of it's actually DCI, is my mm-hmm. understanding. So what was the percentage difference in cost for that thing, just the delivery unit compared to, we're not going to mention the names, sure. we're just going to say DCI compared to some of the big names. Like what were you looking at as far as the cost difference? It's a great question, John. It's half off. Half off? <laughs> it's half price. Oh my goodness! I mean, right. I, I I just I I knew it would be cheaper, but so I didn't know it would be that. We're, we're initially equipping um, seven operatories with you know expanding into nine, mm. you know, and so essentially all we'll need to do is purchase two extra units. And so we looked at seven times, you know, the cost of savings, and I was like, whoa, yeah, you know, it's yeah. it's, it's like it's, that's a car, it's a car, yeah. right? It's yeah. a really nice car, yeah, and so. You know, another thing about DCI is they just formed a partnership with one of my favorite handpiece brands, John. Mm. They formed a partnership with NSK. Oh, really? Yeah. So now, um, and talk a little bit about uh, talk a little bit about <clears throat> DCI in your office because, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll see if I can pull up the image over here. So I know, John, you've been using DCI for yeah. a long time. Yeah. When we built out our office, um, Mike Unthank, who's a big uh, big name dental architect, is who did the design. And, uh, you know, besides just doing the actual architecture, he also talks a lot about products. And so, you know, we were choosing our chairs and units and everything. 
Um, he mentioned DCI kind of over and over again, and we've had these DCI carts, uh, which little different design. It's a cart instead of a wall mount, but the same basic idea. And I mean, we've just had basically no problems. I mean, the only thing you have to do um, is you got to have the occasional uh, small thing that's that's replaced just because of wear and tear, like a piece of tubing that over time wears out, you know, from just being kinked or something like that. So it's just been pretty much trouble free, trouble free. None of the none of the valves, blocks, any of that stuff's ever really needed to be messed with. So yeah, they, it's just been a a great company to work with and work uh, there. We just really haven't had complaints. And it's interesting you talk to their pair people. You know, I always encourage you to if you're building or you're looking to you know renovate or whatever, talk to uh, your your trusted repair technician. Maybe a third party guy. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would I would usually try to go at least a couple of people, so you're not just getting one company's opinion. Because mm. you know you might have your repair persons. Sometimes they're involved in selling. Uh, it depends, right? Mm -hmm. But you can ask them a little bit about who's getting repaired a lot. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know there's been a lot of consolidation with equipment companies too. You know some have just been swallowed up by other companies and. DCI has just stayed around mm -hmm. and has been kind of rock solid for a lot of years. And so I think it's a, definitely something to look at. Yeah, I think the one thing that I liked about the particular rear delivery system is one that the top is solid surface. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people, you know, choose laminate options. John, you have laminate options in there in your office and they've held a fantastic. Yeah. But from a solid surface standpoint, I like that. I've ha I have that now. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, too, that we liked was the, uh, the idea that recently they did form a partnership. I can't find the picture it's so new with nsk mm -hmm. which means now that the nsk handpiece control unit is actually built into and it looks nice and seamless mm. you're not bolting on um, another handpiece per se that's cool so um right now you know I, I mine are bolted on under my unit it's not been a problem but it just is cleaner whenever it is integrated, and <clears throat> um, and so I'm excited about that. Yep. Um, you know, we uh, another thing that we looked at is that everybody is, and we're going to get on to the show. The show today is going to be really good after our word from our sponsors. Don't worry about that. We'll definitely get that in. But another thing, John, we looked at was what kind of light mm. uh, do we put in the operatory? And honestly... You know, one of the things that has happened um, since I opened my practice was that we've moved to wireless lights, right? Right. We've moved to... Well, you've moved to head to headlights or yeah, headlamps, to, right? To headlamps. So we're using that over the traditional operatory light. Yeah. So that's been a big change. And I just bought one from Innova earlier last mm -hmm. year in the mm -hmm. midst of COVID, and I am loving that. That is a whole apparatus that actually sets on my head, and it's amazing the illumination that I get from that. And so the question is, do we invest in like a an unbelievable lighting system mm. for the actual operatory light? Right? Right, right. Or do you buy each one of your assistants, John, and each one of your hygienists a, a headlamp head yeah. and accept the responsibility of that you're going to have to con, you know provide them with maintenance of those? It's not going to be theirs. It's going to be part of the practice. And you're not going to put a light in the operatory at all, you're just going to provide everybody headlamps, whether it's cordless, wireless, yeah. whether it's wireless. And what did you guys decide to do? So we decided that we really didn't want to do that. We wanted to, because we feel like there's so many varying things that could happen, not everybody is going to want to put on a headlamp. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be different hairstyles. There's going to be people that want to wear you know, there's just yeah. going to be so many things to have to decide that a headlamp is like a barrier. Yeah, right? that's true. And so we decided to go with actually DCIs um, over the headlamp. Mm. And, and it's an LED, no frills. It does have a no cure setting, mm -hmm. right? It also has in three intensities. You can see it right here on the screen. And then you can mount it in all kinds of different ways. It doesn't matter what we did, what we chose in our operatory, but... The thing that I like about this, it is modern. It does have no touch sensors. Mm -hmm. And so, and honestly, the cost of this thing, right? It's about $1,300 less than the equivalent in an, in maybe a premium, um, quote unquote brand brand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I still feel like you're getting a really good quality light. I did talk to an equipment rep about mm -hmm. these lights that have been installed here in the past couple of years they're having no issues out of these lights you can get them in white 
or you can get them in the classic dental tan color. We're <laughs> going with white for a cleaner look. Um, so these are some things that we've had to make some decisions on here recently yeah. going into a modern office. What units, what chairs, what equipment we need to take over. Yeah. In a future show, I want to talk about how we're moving from a inoperatory designed you know, where you put Storage. all your instruments and stuff that you're going to need for the day in, day out task. Right. Instead of being stored in the operatory, we're moving to a central sterilization model. Yeah. And I want to talk about that transition. I want to talk about what flow we're going to have in sterilization. And we're going to talk about John's journey from a in a practice in his sterilization system and and how he does things, some systems that he's recently changed. Mm -hmm. And really, I think it's some great advice that you guys are going to look forward to and how things operate as far as from a sterilization model. It's not something you learn in school, John. Right. My associate is asking us questions all the time. Yeah. um, And about even how you do spore testing and all these type of things, maintenance. This is all that behind the scenes stuff that you just have to really learn on the job. And and there's, there are people that, have systems for this that you can go listen to, but there are not a lot of them around. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we'll definitely talk about that in an upcoming show on, you know, Wes is doing things in, a, in in the way that some of which he's doing similar to me and some of which a little different, and we can compare and contrast that if you're looking to, you know, upgrade your, you might get some ideas from that. So we'll be talking about that. But for today's show, because I, I'm excited for, for your future with what we're going to be coming back. For today's show, we're going to talk about some nuts and bolts. We're going to talk about how we handle... Uh, implant, full arch implant conversion prosthetics in our practices. And that's something that um, if you, whether you're you're well into that world of, of all on four quote unquote type of treatment or you're not, uh, just you're starting, it's probably one of the biggest things we deal with as far as logistics. So just after a word from our sponsor, we're going to talk about how to implement that into your practice, how to improve that. So uh, we'll be back in just a couple minutes uh, and uh, pick that right back up. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbray with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. When you find the practice of your dreams to buy, how do you know how much it's worth? Should you accept the appraised value provided by the seller's paid consultants? If so, you could be overpaying for the practice. Negotiating the purchase price of your future practice is not something that you want to go at alone. The seller's representatives are going to do their best to get the seller the best deal. You need to have knowledgeable representation on your side of the table to make sure you're receiving a fair deal. For more information about this and other dental related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com financiallysimple.com for additional information. All right, so we're back after that word. And, you know, it's funny. We just realized as we got together today, uh, if you're watching the YouTube, we're not, we're, we look like we're matching. We we're walking down the road. We we're actually taking, like, we went out to just, like, take a few mile walk as we're talking and stuff. And I looked over Wes. I was like, you realize, I mean, we're even wearing the same color shorts. It's stupid. It's just stupid. So if you're watching the YouTube, you're wondering if we, like, dressed up purposefully. No, this is just, we're just. I feel like, like it's that. not the only time this has ever happened. No, that's happened before. So. <laughs> I don't know why. So, so let's get into the nuts and bolts of the show. You know, you, you, uh, for listeners out there who are doing full arch implant dentistry, um, or getting into it, whether you've been doing it for years or not, one of the most daunting parts of Mm. getting into it, both from a logistical standpoint and a, a, a kind of anxiety inducing standpoint is the full arch interim prosthetic. In other words, the immediate load prosthesis. So the patient is getting all their teeth out. They're getting implants placed, whether it's with you or the surgeon, if you are the surgeon or you have a referring uh, or a uh, surgeon you refer to. And at some point in the day, they've got to get some teeth. That's really what they're paying for in their mind often is the teeth. It's not the implant so much as it often is the teeth in the day. And so there's a lot of pressure uh, on us to be able to provide uh, a, a prosthetic that day that is going to satisfy the aesthetics and the phonetics and the uh, functionality that we want for an interim prosthesis. And 
You know, that is not an easy thing to pull off, Wes. I mean, it's something that we've taught now in our, uh, uh, you know, through RDI, Restorative Driven Implants, and some other places. We've taught uh, on this topic multiple times on how to do a conversion prosthesis. In other words, taking whether it's a, a denture that the patient has and converting that into a fixed restoration the day of surgery or whether it's a mill PMMA that the lab creates for you with mm. pre-drilled holes and super fancy, uh, whether that is um, some type of impression that's taken the day of surgery and sent to the lab or you do your own lab work and you create that indirectly, deliver it the next day. I mean, there are so many ways to do this and all of them have some pros and cons. Mm. So I think what we need to talk about as we go through this discussion is let's talk about the different ways it can be done. Okay. Let's talk about the most basic way, which it, which would be a denture mm -hmm. made prior to surgery that's converted the day of surgery. Let's talk about a guided way of doing it, which would be the lab fabricated PMMA with pre-drilled holes. Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about doing it indirectly taking impressions of some kind the day of surgery and you are the lab doing that. And then let's maybe get into what are we actually doing and when do we do these different approaches? Because there are times I would do it one way and Wes would do it one way and there's times we might change it up depending on the case. So mm -hmm. Wes, why don't you run through a little bit the traditional approach, quote unquote, of denture, conventional denture mm -hmm. made prior to surgery and the advantages of dis and disadvantages and kind of some of, we don't, we're not going to go into super detailed steps on this. Basically, because, John's telling me to shut up. Well, I'm saying, I'm saying we could get bogged down, right? right? Because there's so many steps in this process, but if we can, and so for those of you who have not done this, you're not going to learn how to do it from a podcast, right? No. But, but at least we're going to give you an idea of the logistics mm -hmm. and how it works and what this looks like. So Wes, talk about that. Talk about how, how you would do that if you had a conventional denture type of setup. So, you know, conventional dentures, um, I feel like that I still use these techniques um, even today, mm -hmm. right? Because all this digital stuff and pre-planning and um, all of the things that, you know, we do digitally, we learned analog, John. Yes. Like we learned them how to do you know, these conversions with traditional analog methods, okay? So if you're going to do this, okay, your bailout procedure with the digital is the traditional way or doing nothing right? or taking an impression um, or the patient walks out with a dentulous arches, right? right. And you wait for uncovering right? Um, at 8 to 12 weeks, right, post-surgery. Yep. So, in a traditional denture setup, one of the things that I love, okay, is the full palate, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in the maxilla. The maxilla, if I have a hard stop, right, whether, no matter what kind of flap I lay, right, whether I have to dissect the palate to do zygomatics or we have all kinds of things going on in the maxilla, I like a hard palate stop that the complete denture provides mm. uh, so one of the downsides of a complete denture is that when you do the conversion you do have to cut all that out right okay we're talking about going from removable prosthetics to fixed prosthetics taking that current denture and removing all excess acrylic and that requires quite a bit of removal so the one of the pros is hey i've got a palatal stop to maintain vertical dimension mm -hmm, okay mm -hmm. number two i've got some downside is i've got to remove that palate okay right, right another advantage that i have is that if things don't go well in surgery, mm -hmm. right? I have a denture to give that patient if I have to do a reline procedure or whatever I need to do on that. Right. I can use that denture. So I'm not producing two things. For instance, in my digital conversions, meaning I'm provided with more of a pre-drilled or even sometimes really all the cylinders could be there in some fully guided cases, mm -hmm. Um, a more modern approach per se, like an in sequence design mm -hmm. type prosthetic. With this, I'm with a traditional denture concept, 
I'm not paying for two. So in sequence, I would want, if all the implants don't get, you know, loaded, I've got to have something for the patient to walk out with. Most of the time it's that removable denture. Okay. So removable dentures do provide us with some things that are advantageous. And, And I would say one advantage from a surgical standpoint too is if you're going to do freehanded surgery, mm-hmm. um, you know that that you have maximum flexibility, but it's cuts both ways, right? Right, because the advantage of maximum flexibility is that if you are a surgeon, whether you're the surgeon or the surgeon you're working with is good. Mm-hmm. In other words, they have an idea of where implants need to go <clears throat> to be able to emerge and the proper locations in the final prosthetic and the provisional as well where you don't have, you know, screw accesses coming out all, all yeah. over the place. And let me throw this up here, John, as you're saying that. Yeah. So you've got to have some way of relating right. this, so right? So this is a picture, if you're going on YouTube right now, this is a picture of a prosthetic that was duplicated in clear acrylic. Yep. So you're essentially looking at the denture, right? Except it's clear acrylic. And look what the surgeon did. The surgeon knew that he needed to get the implants inside of that window. Right, behind and the teeth. Behind the teeth. And I knew, as the prosthetic guy, that I needed to put certain angled abutments on these teeth so that those cylinders that you're looking at right there fall inside of that trough, per se, right, and right. they're lingual <clears throat> or palatal to the teeth. So I don't have screw access yeah. holes coming out the facial. So you give the surgeon something like this, and you say, hey, you've got, you've got all of this real estate, basically, mm-hmm. but... It's dream town or it's nightmare town. Because <laughs> if it's dream town, if the surgeon understands the the spacing, right, the limitations, um, the fact that you know you you have to be able to still correct a certain amount of degrees and you also have to have the implants spaced appropriately to where they're not too close and if you're angling posterior implants, you know, you have to make sure that they emerge at the right place. Mm-hmm. And these are all things that you know, when when you show these cases, right, and, and everything's straight and it's all been corrected, uh, if you've done a, maybe a couple of these and it hasn't worked out that way, you look at these cases, you're like, oh, it looks easy, quote unquote, when it's done, right? When you have all the cylinders on, the transmucosal abutments are on. But you and I know that that, that takes a lot of skill for the surgeon, mm-hmm. especially for the surgeon. And then sometimes... For the restorative doc uh, or the lab technician whoever is doing this, in order to select the correct transmucosals, see where the angles are going, it's a bloody mess in there. You know, you 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 really sometimes struggle until you start cutting this denture, which which kind of commits you to your, your going forward with it. Mm-hmm. Um, it you re- you start to appreciate all the things that can go wrong. Right. So I love this approach. It's how I was taught. And I feel like when I'm unsure of how things are going to go, oftentimes this is what I end up doing. So here's, let me tell you, let me tell you what's, what's happening recently. Okay. Just on a few of my cases. So we do the digital design, right? We print the PMMA, right? They hand stack the um, Gradia composite on there for the pink, okay? Mm -hmm. Or whatever they're using, right? And it's this beautiful PMMA with like four to six holes cut in it for yep. where the cylinders are going to go. You do the guided surgery, you do the bony reduction, you put this in. It is a little larger when you put it in so that you do have some stopping, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. basically hard stops so you can hold vertical. All that stuff is all pre planned. But then let's say that the surgeon gets in there and one of your distal implants, mm. right? I know what you're going to say, is a spinner. Oh boy. Right. And the surgeon says, you know, I don't like this. And you're like, well, that means that we we have to cut off the denture at the canine if we don't have an implant back there that has primary stability. Okay. Yep. Now, and, I mean, this happens. Okay? Right. So then the surgeon says, but I can back that implant out and move it to a different location. And they do. And achieve torque. And they achieve torque. And now I can somewhat achieve the same final restoration, but now all the digital planning that I did for that one site requires Uh, moving a hole with an acrylic burr, maybe one whole tooth over, and now I have this massive hole in PMMA. You know what PMMA is? It is acrylic, 
but it's also very brittle. Yep. And ask me how I know. Oh man. What happens when you try to cut that stuff, and and the whole thing and breaks the whole in thing, half. thing breaks in half. Yeah, it happens. It happens, and guess what? You have in the bag because it happens a denture. Yeah, and you end up sometimes after all the work we do for digital planning. And cutting those holes, pre-drilling the holes, even to the extent of choosing your cylinders with the proper angle already. Cho- and, you know, but you end up going back to this conventional denture approach and having to just back up and punt, essentially. And that really gets us into that second way of doing it, right? Yeah. So we're I mean, now... I'm going to pull up a picture there. You go ahead and go talk about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we realize we're already coming into this, making it sound like we don't like the guided approach we really do oh yeah every time because i want that every single time if i have an option between conventional and guided and i and my surgeon will follow the guide (laughs) and do what i ask them to do even if i have to stand there and hold their hand and whisper sweet nothings in their ear to get them to actually do what i'm telling them to um then i love a guide and i think it's a it's a beautiful thing when it all works out and i've had many of these cases that have but you have to be familiar, Wes, because I think sometimes it's sold to us as, oh, we'll just do it all guided. And that's all great until just one implant doesn't achieve torque. And then you really have to understand how to do this conventional denture approach because you're going to find yourself having to turn your PMMA into you know, uh, the same thing or start basically completely over with a conventional denture. So I think the takeaway from the conventional denture approach is you can use it on almost every case as long as you understand all of the limitations and steps. So Wes is going to put up a picture of this is the guided approach when things work out well. And honestly, in this particular shot, John, we can see, and let me actually maximize the screen here just a little bit. There we go. Yeah, that's better. And I think you can see my cursor on the screen there, John, is that in this particular situation, you can see one of these little boo-boos here. Right. So what Wes is showing, for those of you who are listening is he's showing a milled PMMA that's been pre-drilled with some holes, and the holes line up with uh, five Five, out of the six implants with no modification or very minor. But there's one where the implant ended up having to be angled slightly differently than what originally planned, and there's probably, I don't know, three or four millimeter extension to the hole that had to be created to get passive fit. And you know what? That's not a big deal. That's pretty straightforward day. But that's actually a really good day when but, you see but that. But let's talk about that for just a second. <laughs> because how hard is it to take a PMMA that is thin, like you said, and if you have five out of the six implants that go right where they need to go, and number six is, or whatever it is, the last one, there's only one, only has to be one. It's always the distal That's one, off, right? right? And then you have to figure out where to drill that hole. Now, there's lots of techniques. We're not going to get into, again, huge technique discussion, but we're going to say there are multiple ways to mark when you put the cylinder on mm-hmm. and you line things up and then you maybe put some bite registration material in there and you mark it. And, but until, but but what's your exact angle when you take that round burr and you penetrate through the first time? You could get it wrong and then you could end up having to correct it and it can be extremely time consuming. It can be destructive to the prosthetic. Mm-hmm. So I think that, have you ever went to a surgeon's office, John? I'm going to digress here just a little bit. And you are you show up for this surgery, and you're like, hey, I need a straight hand piece. Mm. Lab hand piece type of thing. Lab hand piece. Right. And they hand you a haul drill? And they hand you a haul drill. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love a haul drill, but not for that. And yet, I have... Let me tell you a little... Let me tell you one story. I know. That's why I'm bringing this up. So, <laughs> I don't think he's listening. But he probably is. So we love our surgeon. He's a great surgeon. And he's one of the best surgeons I've ever seen in my life. He's amazing. And But every time we go to this surgeon's office, what brother, I, brother, brother, I got a, I got a case I need you to look at, not operatory three. I just, I mean, I know it's not your case, but I just need you to look at it. I need it. your opinion over here. Yeah. So I, brother, right. So, so for reasons I will not go into, the surgeon was tasked with delivering a zirconia final prosthetic, which obviously that's not what we want. We don't want our surgeons delivering our final prosthetics, but long story, well, the occlusion wasn't right. Mm. So they need an occlusal adjustment on a zirconia final prosthetic. Can I get a high speed hand? Can I get a, can I get, can I get a, 
Can I get a high speed? Can I get a high speed? Can I get a high speed? Uh, uh, high speed's down, brother. Uh, we don't have a cart. We don't have a cart, and it's down. But uh, <laughs> I got some zirconia adjustment diamonds in a hull drill. <laughs> I was like, "What's it? You make? They make diamonds for zirconia that fit in? A, oh, okay. Let me at it." So I went in there, and we got an assistant blowing saline <laughs> on a hull. <laughs> and I'm adjusting occlusion on zirconia with a hall drill. I mean, spitting sparks over a five county area and trying not to light this man on fire. And, tr- and of course, trying to hold a hall like with the, si- the side grip because I'm not a I'm not a oral surgeon. So I guess I'm not used to that. How was the anatomy after you finished? Adjusting? I mean, it was it was a little flatter than I, it was a little flat, flat plane, flat plane occlusion. It was flat. Zero I was, degree T. I was just like a monoplane occlusion is what I go. But my point, our point here is. You don't always have the equipment you need no. if you're at the surgeon's office. So when you when it comes to adjusting something like this, it's not easy. It's it's very time consuming. And sometimes, honestly, you have to step back to the denture and you have to punt. So let's maybe talk before we talk about the impression option. Mm. Okay, because that's kind of option number three. Let's talk about who is doing this. Okay, because you got so many options there, Wes. I and mean, how much do you charge? How right? much do you charge? That's the question, right? So who does this conversion? Many of you are listening to this and you're thinking like, man, I, I've never done this before and I want to do these cases. I've started to get implant training from whether it's from one of our courses, Restorative Driven Implants. Yeah, I plugged us right there, John. <laughs> Perfect. Um, you know, whether you've taken master series courses in other courses, but you're ready to go to the next level, who teaches these conversions to you Mm. one do you have the training or do you rely on your lab right and this is the thing that's interesting is that sometimes i think that this is where interviewing a lab that has an extreme uh, proficiency in doing these cases and doing these cases with that lab from start meaning like surgical preparation Mm -hmm all the way through final prosthetics. And if you're doing that in that manner, you're going to get customer service from that lab. Don't do these cases without a lab that can provide you, one, with good customer service. Number two, they need to have the knowledge of the conversion. They do. Right? And so they can actually maybe pre-drill the holes digitally, Mm -hmm. or maybe they can provide you with a denture that has some type of markings on it whatever that is, and maybe they even provide a service right. to come and actually do this chair so side when, with you. So, if, so let's talk about this, okay? If you are new to this, okay? If you are new to this, now, I don't know. We haven't talked about this before the show. I personally believe, this is, I don't know. We haven't talked about this, that you should do this yourself with a lab technician there with you. I feel uh, if you can find a lab technician that's done a bunch of this and you can take some courses, you need to take some courses on this. You don't just need to dive into this, in my opinion. I think you need to take some courses and learn how the conversion prosthesis really works on a bench top before you've done any of it. You're talking about a first time user. I'm talking about first time. I'm talking about a new user. And then the first time you do this, the best approach, in my opinion, is to have a lab technician in there, but you do it and you struggle through it. And you learn through struggling through it how to do this because you need to, you have to learn how to troubleshoot this because you know what? When that first prosthetic breaks three days after the conversion and the lab can't make it to your office again, you might have to manage the case. Or if you have an implant go south on you at a couple of weeks and, yep. and the surgeon backs that out. Then what are you, you going to do? Then you can mitigate that and you're starting to learn. So how many, and this is how I learned, John. I actually invited the lab to all of my full arch cases. I mean, probably for the first, say, 20, 30 arches, Mm, mm. you know? I mean, maybe even more. I don't even know, but a lot, right? Yeah. I mean, my first one I did, it took me six hours, you know, and I told the lab technician, I said, I want you to be here in case I completely lose control right. of this case. Because, I mean, I, I, I had taken courses. I had mm-hmm. seen it done. Yeah. And then I, I said, all right, I'm going to do one and I want you to watch me and right. coach me. But it still took me six hours because 
you know, various things can go wrong, and it was fine in the end. But I do feel like that's a good way to start off is have the Now, other people say, well, I'm just going to have the lab do it. So what are the downsides of that? Because then let me just say that. I'm, I'm just going to disagree with that. Like if you just don't even show up for the surgery and you just say lab fix it, make it happen. Yep. Right? Which is very common. Which is very common, right? Do this. I'm not coming to the surgery. It doesn't matter to me. Whoa. Then you don't need, I mean, I'm just going to say it, John. You don't need to be doing these cases. No, I agree. I agree. I'm not saying, we're not saying that you can't have a lab do it, um, but there's a, a relationship that needs to be built with mutual understanding of what the requirements are that you have. Right. I'm not saying be there for the entire surgery, but when you get to this prosthetic part, you know, you need to learn to know or know what went on during surgery. Yep. Because there are times, no matter how good your surgeon is, how good your lab is, where you know, you say, you know what, I need you to sink that implant another couple of millimeters mm-hmm. because I'm a little bit worried about vertical. Mm-hmm. Or, you know what, I really want to make sure I give this person second molar occlusion here because they really need it. Because I'm, I'm, and you know, you, you or maybe the patient. Or, Go ahead. Or how about this? I took out those posterior implants that we did, that we thought we were going to do there, and I went ahead and did zygomatics. Right. 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 Because I didn't get stability. So, and Or or you have something that happens where which converts your prosthetic from a fixed mm. to a definitive final bar over denture. <clears throat> yep. Now, you talk about a conversation. Right. I have had these conversations preoperatively with the patient, and it not happened. Yep. And preoperative with the patient, and it actually happened. Right. And because you and the surgeon have this in the mind, you've had a discussion, and you're not just relying on the lab's knowledge, yep. which there's some amazing lab technicians that oh, yeah. could be even dentists, yep. right? And they have more knowledge than I've got. And that's the kind of people that I want chairside with me to help mitigate these issues at the most crucial time because what happens in surgery really dictates the ease of... Mm-hmm. that this case is going to go from here forward. Yeah, right? but but if you don't have ownership, and mm-hmm. you know, you listen to the show for any amount of time, you know we're big on this, but we are not uh, we are not just basically providing a service that's a monetary service and a commodity. You need to own these cases as a clinician. The lab is there to assist you. The lab is there to advise you. And you know, yes, as Wes said, sometimes, I mean, I've had the lab May overrule me. Sometimes I'm doing something and the lab technician says, you know what? I think we should do it this way. And I look at it and go, you know what? You're right. Like that happens. Absolutely happens. But it's a mutual respect where I, I, that can happen to me or that can happen to the lab. But, but our point is here, you need to learn and own this as a clinician. If you're going to do these cases, because no matter then, no matter who the surgeon is, no matter who the lab is, you're the one who's basically selling this to the patient. And in the end, you're the one who's going to be responsible for delivering the final prosthesis. So we do think you need to be involved in the conversion. Now, I do see some people out there say, look, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've got a lab I work with in every case. There's certain cases that I can give to the lab and yeah, say, no, do but it. That's, that's and after, that's, and that's, that's, after okay. that's after wisdom and yeah. trust. A lot of experience. A lot of experience has been given. Yep. A lot of, like, I remember this one time. I'm not joking you when I say this. Is that, and, that, and they're listening to this show right now. I know they are. Okay. So one time I had a patient that had their husband get in an accident. Okay, and we're doing an upper and lower full arch on this patient. The lower is going to be a fixed uh, bar wrapped in acrylic, f- definitive. The upper is going to be a definitive bar over denture, mm-hmm. okay, removable. Low, upper is going to be zygos, and the lower is going to be five uh, implants. Okay, so I get the phone call the day before. Husband's been in an accident. She's canceling the surgery. Mm. Okay, I'm, and it was a bad accident. And her surgery is going to be like the following day. Well, I'd blocked off, you know, four or five hours to be, run down there, do the conversion with the lab. The lab happened to be in the in town at the time. And just so you know, you know, the lab doesn't always come to my conversions now. A lot of times I'm doing my own conversions because I've done them for years, okay? So I don't even have the lab there anymore. But the lab was going to be there doing some other cases, and they happened to be there during this time. So I get a text 
the next morning, like at nine o'clock, I'm sitting on the couch, John, drinking my coffee, right? I'd slept in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my one of my other buddies that was doing a conversion at the same time, another dentist, he was like, hey, man, where are you at? And he's taking a selfie with him and the lab guy doing my conversion. <laughs> oh, man. So she showed up. <laughs> she showed up even with her husband in ICU. Oh, my goodness. And had this done. That's the kind of patient I want. But, you know, in this situation, you know, my lab guy texted me and he said, I want you to know I'm really proud of this. And he's been doing it for 30 years. Yeah. And he sent me pictures. He took pictures. He knows I'll teach. And he took all these pictures for me. And he was like, the case turned out amazing. How and, funny. And that was so good. You know, that was, but a lot of trust was given there. Yeah. Like I was sitting on the couch and I said, you know what? I don't need to run down there. Yeah. And that's, that's a long-term relationship and it can work. And all, I guess what we're trying to get across is you need to establish that relationship, but we think you need to have. Uh, the enough experience on your own to where you can troubleshoot. You're going to mm. have things happen to these interim prosthetics that you're going to have to manage in your practice. The only way to know how to manage them is to do them yourself. So, so, and uh, let's talk about the third way of doing it, right? Mm-hmm. Which is impressioning. Yeah. And and what I want to do at the end of this, John, we didn't talk about this before, is let's get into some of our favorite products as far as picking up cylinders. Yeah, that's a great, okay? that's a great way to Because no matter what, you're going to go through a time where you're going to have to pick a cylinder up in the mouth, whether it's to repair one yep. or whether you're doing it intraoperatively. Love it. So let's talk about that and we'll talk about where we started. But the third way is kind of like not teeth today, it's teeth tomorrow. Right. And there's actually a marketing term, actually. Actually, it's trademarked for that. Yep. Um, and I think it's uh, Dr. Tischler. Exactly, Michael and, Tischler. Yeah, yeah, he's doing, um, you know, teeth tomorrow. And I think it's a good option. Yeah. In fact, I've used that option many times um, because sometimes <clears throat> the patient does not cooperate under anesthesia. Right. Um, sometimes the things go awry and things go way off plan. And, but things turn out okay, right? Mm-hmm. Enough to where you have implant stability and you're able to take an open tray impression. So no matter what, John, I'm prepared for picking up the PMMA day of procedure. I have a backup denture that I can actually cut holes in or send the patient home with if mm-hmm. we decide to bury all the implants. And then the third thing I have sitting there is impression, open tray impression copings, John, to take a open tray, full arch impression so that I can deliver a teeth tomorrow or teeth in a week Mm -hmm. solution. One would say, well, how long can you wait before you load those implants? I'm going to safely say if you're within that five to seven day Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. range, you're going to be safe to do that. You need to check with your surgeon and their comfort level. Our surgeon's pretty comfortable with five to seven days delivering that prosthetic under load because you're splinting all those implants together. Once you get beyond that seven day, you're starting to get into that dental dip as far as biology goes when it comes to the integration of the dental implant. But John, the third way is really something I have in my backpack all yeah. the time. And I've used it a few times that, you know, the downside of that approach <clears throat> only is, <clears throat> excuse me, that you've got to have a way to also relate size, alleged position, occlusion, mm-hmm. um, the bite. And so there's we're not going to again dive too deep yeah, into this. There, you can go. There's way, different ways of yes. doing that. You know, yeah. you've got to either have a wax rim or you've got to have some type of PMMA that's set as your impression or tray. Or there's got to be preoperatively vertical dimension, right. digital exactly. you articulation. Got to, got to have digital I articulation. Mean, there's so there's weight. That's a very. I mean, it is a backup plan in certain ways, but it's and in certain ways can bail you out. But it's also you got to have a lot more information to make that happen. Whereas if you have the patient in front of you. You can, to some extent, eyeball it, right? You can look at inside the ledge position. Mm. You can look kind of where the lip is, even if they're So let me numb. give you a quick tip right here. If you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, what if I don't have those things? Get you some um, triad base, mm-hmm, okay? Mm-hmm. And you can take a couple cylinders that are in the mouth, one left and one right of the midline. You can take some triad, and you can just light cure that material. Durasplint is another product we like. Mm-hmm. You can set in sizal edge position really quick with two cylinders, John. That's exactly and right. And you can create a analog wax, you know, aesthetic, you know, smile right. slash clusal plane, clusal plane mm-hmm. and get some kind. I mean, that's a quick tip right there. Right. Tip of the week right there yeah. is to use maybe you could like your triad or a Durasplint material, something that's hard rigid. Okay. And send that to the lab with your impression. So always having a few cylinders on hand for these type of things, 
really makes a big difference. Yeah. You got to have parts and pieces. These cost a lot of money. I think, you know, what am I charging, John, for something like mm. an interim prosthetic? I'm taking time out of my day mm -hmm. to go. I'm taking time away from my practice or my family. John, I'm, I'm charging quite a bit for an interim prosthetic. Sure. Because I've spent a lot of time either providing that patient with a removable prosthetic mm -hmm. or the future of PMMA. I'm providing my knowledge as far as where these abutments need to yeah. go, how they need to emerge. Whether it goes in or not that day, I am charging for my interims. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think we should, <clears throat> whether you roll that into the cost of the final and just have a package deal based on that. <clears throat> it or needs to be you, built into your overhead, right? And if you're and if the lab's there, they obviously have a charge as well. And they're going to charge you to be there. That's right, and they should. And some surgeons cover that fee, some right. don't. You have to negotiate that up front, right? Make sure you know who's paying for the lab, who's paying for the parts, um, you know, for the transmucosals. Make sure you have, like Wes said, plenty of backup stock for when the PMMA doesn't go, and you have to switch mm. from a 30 degree to a 17 How degree. How many times and, I've ran back to my office to oh, grab man. stuff? I mean, all the time. So this is the, another value of the lab, you know, is that they ha typically know what they're going to need. They have a pelican case they, full of That's stuff. right. That's right. Or the rep, having the product rep there, Ooh. if it's a company that has a rep, you know, and you can Great say, tip hey, there. show up to the surgery, have some backup parts and pieces that I will only open and pay for if I have to use them, versus you having to carry all the inventory yourself. Mm. So those are things to think about. And, I, you know, again, hopefully this gives you guys some ideas of, of the different ways of doing it, how mm. to do it. So as we finish the show, let's, Wes, as Wes said, let's talk about products. Let's talk about pickup products. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I, you know, there's several different types. Mm -hmm. We've got your, basically it's your composite materials. Go ahead. Yeah. And your acrylic materials. That's what it all kind of comes mm -hmm. down to. And there's several of them available. I mean, the most basic is cold cure acrylic, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you want to talk about something we know is compatible with your acrylics, it's cold cure. Mm -hmm. So you can use anything. You can use your good old, you know, crown and bridge jet acrylic if you want. You know, mm -hmm. anything that has that wonderful monomer smell, you know, is going to work to bond to conventional denture and give you an excellent result. Uh, the downside, of course, of those materials is set time. Yeah, it's cold cure. It's cold cure. It's not instant. Exactly, and you know you have to wait a while. Like five minutes. That's right. It's a long time. Uh, then you've got your composite type materials. Yeah, so that would be like uh, ERA pickup material, right? Or quick up, or quick up, yep. or easy pickup, or yep. and those all have the advantage of being quicker to set. Mm -hmm. Some of them are dual cure. Most of them are chemical cure, mm -hmm. which we want to have a chemical cure component to this. Obviously, we can't get the light everywhere mm -hmm. uh, easily on the first on the first go. Um, but they're quicker setting. The downside is you have to have a primer, right? You have to have a primer and make sure you get the primer on everything, which is not always easy when you have a bloody field. Not always easy mm. to get a primer on the cylinders. Mm. It's not always easy to get primer on the acrylic to, to stay there once the blood starts flowing. Tricks of the trade, right, John? Yeah. There's some stuff we do to kind of do that. But, yeah, primer is an important step, right? Yep, yep. And then you got light cured materials, which yep. which can work. What's your favorite, John? So for me, I like the composites. Yeah. And and I like the composites because I think the handling is easier than mixing up cold cure and putting it into a syringe. Now it costs more, but I don't really care in these cases about cost. We hopefully are making enough that we're able to buy a product. But I like the fact that composite sets quickly. I like the fact that it handles well out of a dual barrel syringe. I like the fact that I can go back in with even a flowable composite if I need to add to it. I know mm. it's going to bond to back to the composite easily. Mm -hmm. Only thing I don't like about it is you got to have a primer and you got to get the primer on everything or else it doesn't bond as well to the cylinders. What, yeah, gotta, what about you, Wes? Yeah, I'm doing the same thing. I'm using a composite based material and the primer is so key. I, ask me how I know because I forgot to put the primer on and mm -hmm. what happens is is that these PMMAs are so smooth mm -hmm. that from the last they just come so they're drilled with a mill yep and it's and if you unless you micro etch it which i recommend micro etching mm -hmm. um your pmmas and then i recommend steam cleaning them or alcohol the inside to remove any of the aluminum oxide mm -hmm. and then adding that primer into the pmma or even the acrylic right it's mm -hmm. important that i mean pmma is acrylic or even like your processed denture bases like you know your ivacap those type mm -hmm. of things or even these uh printed denture bases they're all acrylic based right. materials now one thing <clears throat> that i've incorporated into my practice for 
metal metal parts right and though that has really been a game changer right for me is uh, this product and at the lab actually the lab actually suggested this and I'm gonna bring it up on the screen but it's a product and I'm gonna say this is a product of the week for me John it's GC metal primer 2 okay it's made for um, made by the company that makes Fuji, right? Many of you all know what Fuji 2 LC is, Fuji 9. We use it for class 5 composites, but a great company, okay? And this is GC Metal Primer 2. Um, it's not cheap, John. Mm. It's probably po- approaching 100 bucks for that little bottle right there. Ooh. But let me tell you right now. Does it work? It works amazing, Okay, and especially if you're using metal cylinders, right? Mm, and and mm-hmm. a lot of my cases, I'm using metal cylinders. Some cases, I am using peak materials, which you would use an acrylic primer for that. But a lot of times, we're using metals and we're bonding acrylic and these composites to that metal. Yeah. And so this primer has been fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I would highly recommend that you start using it on your titanium uh, cylinders and maybe even on your locators uh, when you're picking up locators in the mouth, John. So well, there you go. Product there you of go. the week. Product GC, of the week. GC and Metal Primer. GC makes good stuff for sure um, and uh, often does not uh, advertise it. So it's funny. They, we have a bitterness about that because yeah. we love GC. Well, we've talked about this before. Several of these companies that out of Japan, they don't do a lot of marketing. They don't do a lot of advertising, but mm-hmm. they make great products. And uh, here's another one that you probably hadn't heard of. It's not new, but it's but it's something that really works. So try it out. So I think that this has been hopefully a good primer ha, <laughs> for uh, everyone out there to start feeling a little bit more confident on what's available with different ways to create a conversion prosthetic kind of some things to watch out for. Hopefully you're going out talking to your lab after this uh, this uh, podcast and saying, okay, let's talk about our next case. What are we going to do differently? Or if it's you know wanting to get into this, um, you have some ideas of what to be watching out for. Um, we Yes, we will plug that we are teaching this stuff sometimes. And so if you want to go check out Restorative Driven Implants, that's certainly a place you can find out more. But there's lots of other good places that out there. It's not just us. But just make sure you take a good course, learn how to do this well, because it's such a practice builder. Mm. If you can do this well, pull off a teeth the same day, so satisfying for it's you amazing. and the patient. It's really a game changer. If you've liked what we've said on this show, if this has helped you, we want you to reach out and let us know. And that can be through all the social media outlets, of course, because we are active on those. But maybe more importantly, can be giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and also following, liking, and sharing all of our stuff on social media. That's how we get our information out there to more listeners like you. So if you love what we're doing, we want you to share it, get it out there. It's been another great show, Wes. Yeah, man. John, I really appreciate you coming to my studio. Yeah. Right? We'll do it again sometime. Hey, so for John the Dental Guy, I'm Wes the Dental Guy. Thank you so much for listening tonight. Have a great day.